Have you ever had trouble winning hands against the tightest player in your game? The one who always seems to have it every time they're in a pot, who never seems to bluff, but who manages to win anyway? If you're having difficulty beating the nits, this video is for you. Nit is a term that has been around in poker for a number of years and seems to have stood the test of time even as other poker terminology has changed significantly. I'm Matt Hunt and today we're going to be discussing how to beat the nits. To me, it comes down to four primary characteristics. The first thing is that the player is highly risk averse. They don't like to gamble and they're looking to get their money in with the best hand whenever possible. We've all encountered players like this. They probably even take a level of pride in never taking the worst of it when they're all in. The second characteristic we'll often observe is that they'll be overfolding most nodes of the game tree, simply due to their unwillingness to invest chips in the pot without confidence that they have the best hand. The only exception to this will be in situations where they already massively overfolded one node of the game tree on a certain street, meaning their range on the next street might contain exclusively very strong hands which aren't likely to fold. In addition to this, their overall aggression frequencies are likely to be very low. They'll do a lot of checking when they should be betting and very little raising. Needless to say, when they do take aggressive lines, they're extremely unlikely to be bluffing. In fact, many of them will adopt a strategy of essentially never bluffing. This means all of their aggressive ranges will be very value heavy, and their preflop ranges will, of course, be tighter than average in virtually every spot. All of these factors will combine to create the type of table image that is usually relatively quickly identifiable as your classic knit profile. With this in mind, I want you all to meet our opponent for this video, the embodiment of the knit archetype. His name is Joe, and he's an 85-year-old recreational poker player from the USA. Joe's defining characteristic is that he does not like to gamble. He enjoys poker as a game, but he's not interested in the big pots or big action. Much in fact that he only 3-bets preflop with pocket aces. Even kings are a calling hand for Joe. He will call hands preflop, but mostly with hands in the top 10-15% to 15 of the deck, so his overall VPIP is going to be very low. He never check raises or bluffs in any way. After all, when Joe first started playing poker in the late 1950s, check raising wasn't even allowed in most games. Finally, Joe's other defining characteristic is that he will only raise when he has the nuts on the river. He won't even raise with the nuts on the flop or turn, because there's still a possibility he could lose the hand on the river. Obviously, he's leaving a lot of money on the table by doing this, but Joe's not there for the money, so he doesn't mind. Now, many players who encounter Joe in tournaments, or who play against him in cash games, have a variety of complaints about playing with him. You'll frequently hear variations of the following quotes. Joe just always has it. If Joe gets to the river, he already has a strong hand, he's probably not going to fold. You can't get value from Joe because he never pays you off. Or when Joe raises, you should just fold everything. There are elements of truth in all of these statements, particularly the last one, but they reveal a lot of common misconceptions with regard to how we actually make money from playing against tight players, which we'll explore in a second. But first, let's take a macro level view of how we actually make money against players like Joe, because we can all readily identify that these players aren't playing well, but it can be hard to figure out exactly where our money is coming from. Let's take a look at a few obvious ways in which we make money from Joe before we look at the less obvious ways. First, one fairly trivial aspect of playing against Joe is that he gives us very little incentive to invest chips in a pot once he's already in there. His ranges are all very tight, which reduces the equity of all our hands, and he doesn't bluff at all, but we have very limited incentive to bluff catch or call down. In other words, spots in which we would usually be forced to continue with middle strength hands in order to avoid overfolding, now become very comfortable folds, and Joe never bluffs us off of a good hand. Obviously, this helps us to make money. Secondly, Joe folds too much preflop when facing a raise, which means our open raises are going to print a lot more money than they usually would especially when he's on the button or in the big blind, since those are spots where players would usually be fighting back against our opens relatively aggressively. We're going to take down a lot more pots pre-flop against Joe and generally face less pre-flop resistance. Finally, we're never going to get denied our equity when we're in position. We're always going to have the option to either bet and face a call or fold, or simply check and see the next street. This is because Joe never check raises, and he only raises with the nuts on the river meaning the only time we ever end up folding to a raise from Joe is when we have no equity anyway because he has the nuts. 
This means our overall post-flop equity realization will almost always be fairly high. Since even though we're up against a tighter range than we usually would be, we're going to see all three streets a lot more often as well. And we will still have the opportunity to win the occasional pot without showdown when the board runs out unfavorably for Joe's range. However, one of the key ways in which we make money against Joe is not obvious at all. In fact, it's an example of what I refer to as invisible EV. In other words, it's EV that we gain from that's not happening as opposed to that is. And we don't even have to change our strategy at all in order to benefit from it. Here's what I mean. I ran an experiment to showcase this phenomenon where I used a preflop to set up a four-handed 30 big blind scenario with a big blind ante to replicate a tournament spot. In this spot, we're going to imagine that we're on the button and Joe is in the cutoff. And we're just playing pure chip EV in this spot to keep it simpler. The two scenarios I tested here were a basic GTO scenario with standard raise sizings and no locked ranges, and then a scenario where Joe is in the cutoff and he's only open raising with 10% of hands. As you can see, dropping the opening range of the cutoff from almost 37% to only 10% massively reduces the cutoff's win rate, from 35.8 big blinds per 100 to only 19.3 big blinds per 100. Interestingly though, even though Joe is opening much tighter than he's supposed to, he's still capturing more than half of his expected win rate here. However, the real magic takes place when we look at our own strategy and win rate on the button here. In the third column, you can see that our overall VPIP once Joe opens is much tighter than it is versus a GTO opponent. We're only putting money in the pot about 17% of the time, compared to more than 27%. This is because Joe is opening tightly, obviously. And you can see that our win rate after Joe opens is significantly reduced as well. We're only winning around 15 big blinds per 100 once Joe opens the pot, instead of almost 35 big blinds per 100 against a GTO opponent. So if we're forced to play tighter once Joe opens, and we're making less money once he opens, shouldn't that mean we're making less money overall? Well, in fact it doesn't, because as you can see in the fifth column, our overall win rate in this four-handed scenario actually jumps from 44.6 big blinds per 100 to 46.4 big blinds per 100. How is this possible? The answer lies in what happens after Joe doesn't open. Even though we're forced to play tighter versus his opens, and we're not making as much money against his opens as we previously were, he's now open folding the cutoff 90% of the time instead of only around 63%. This means we get a lot more opportunities to open the button once he folds, which is a very profitable situation for us. If it's not clear how this works, imagine we have a hand like Jack-9 offsuit on the button, and Joe is dealt a hand like King-5 suited. Joe is supposed to open raise this hand and force us to fold our jack nine and lose the hand. But when he elects to fold instead, we now have the opportunity to profitably open jack nine off on the button and play the pot against the blinds. All the occasions where this happens add up quite significantly, meaning that even though we're forced to play much tighter against Joe's opens and we make less money in those spots, we're compensated by having more opportunities to play in position versus the blinds which is a high EV spot for us, even if the blinds are still playing GTO. This is a big part of how making money from tight players works. Some of our EV simply comes from the fact that we are getting a greater number of later position open raise opportunities when they're folding hands that they should be raising. We can see even further evidence of this from the fact that the small blind and big blind win rates are both a lot higher as well. All three players are making more money from Joe folding the cutoff much, even though they are forced to fold a lot more often once he actually does open. Let's now look at a similar situation, except where Joe is in the big blind. I've run a three-handed 50 big blinds, big blind anti scenario to illustrate this one. In this spot, we can expect Joe to defend a lot tighter than the nearly 80% frequency he's supposed to call from the big blind against the min raise. In fact, because this hand is only three-handed with no players acting before the button, the lack of bunching effect means the big blind is supposed to almost never fold versus an open. In addition to knowing that Joe defends his big blind a lot tighter, in this case we've gone with around 27% of hands, we know that Joe only 3-bets with pocket aces, which makes our response to a 3-bet fairly simple. We won't worry about that for now. Another crucial element is the fact that we can expect Joe to significantly overfold to a small c-bet on the flop. We've been able to account for that in our calculations as well, assigning him a roughly 20% overfold, as well as a 0% check raise frequency. As you can see, all these factors take our button opening range from 56% all the way up to any two cards, and our overall win rate on the button has skyrocketed 
from 53.4 big blinds per 100 up to a massive 98.8 big blinds per 100. We're winning almost one big blind per hand. Obviously, this is another way in which we massively profit from Joe's mistakes. We can freely open any two cards on his big blind from the button, and substantially wider in other positions as well. Between his tendency to overfold the big blind and his tendency to open too tightly, we've already made a lot of money off Joe before we ever start to get into any more complex nodes of the game tree. This is a very important factor to keep in mind when playing against tighter players. A lot of the money you make comes from spots that you don't see, as opposed to the ones you do. You don't get to see when your opponent makes an incredibly tight fold, but you make money every single time it happens. Now that we've established how we're going to adapt our opening ranges to Joe's tightness in the big blind, let's look at how we might adapt on the rare occasions where Joe is the one opening. There's actually a fairly simple hack I like to use when defending against players who are tighter than usual. We just scale back our response to what it would be if they opened one, two, or even three positions earlier. For a scenario where a nit opens the button, we treat it like a hijack or a low jack open. When they open the low jack, we might treat it like they're opening under the gun. But what do we do when they open under the gun? After all, in this spot, it's very possible Joe might be even tighter with his opens than a normal nine-handed under the gun range, which is very tight to begin with. In this graphic, you can see the results of another experiment I ran, where we're defending the big blind at 50 big blinds effective versus a min raise open from Joe, with a big blind ante in play. Positions aren't relevant here, only the actual range that Joe is opening, and the game tree is the same in all examples. You can see that the first three columns look relatively standard as big blind defense spots go. But since 15% is pretty close to being the tightest opening range we'll see in a GTO scenario with a big blind ante in play, the next two columns are where it gets very interesting. If Joe is only opening 10% of hands, our folding frequency shoots all the way up to almost 50%, and if he's tight enough to only open the top 5%, it tops 65%. Interestingly, if he's opening exactly aces and aces only, we get to fold slightly less often. But that's understandable considering that post-flop play gets a lot easier when we know our opponent's exact hand. As you can tell, our response to Joe's opens is going to look significantly tighter than GTO, and it would be a pretty big mistake for us to continue calling with the GTO big blind defense range if Joe is opening extremely tightly. We can't account for all the mistakes Joe might make post-flop, but it's difficult for him to play a very strong range of hands badly that it offsets how strong his range is to begin with. Now, the next part of our process is to begin figuring out what we're actually going to do post-flop on the occasions where Joe does defend against our open. The major problem we have to deal with here is that Joe's calling range is extremely condensed, to the point where it's going to be very strong and uncapped on a large number of flops. When you combine this with the fact that we're opening wide to capitalize on his tight defending, it's going to compound and create a scenario where we're at a big equity disadvantage on a lot of boards. However, one potential lifesaver for us is that while Joe is supposed to do a lot of donk betting on account of his overall equity advantage, it's unlikely he actually will. Meaning that there will be plenty of boards where if he plays a pure check strategy and has no donk bets, we actually should play a pure check strategy as well and simply never bet any hand when checked to. The only thing that might allow us to start betting these boards is the fact that Joe is never check raising us. It means we can be very confident of realizing a good portion of our equity on future streets. Obviously our equity isn't very good though, we have to be cautious in evaluating how much of a benefit this really is. Let's establish what Joe's potential preflop defending range might look like. You can see it here on the left, without any two button opening range on the right. We have Joe defending all pairs up to kings. All broadways, suited gappers since Joe likes to flop straights and flushes, and a few other stronger suited hands. It's about 27% of hands overall, and it's much, much tighter than an optimal big blind defense range with a big blind ante in play. It actually looks a lot more like a high rake cash game defending range, perhaps against a larger open size. I used this pair of ranges to run a variety of different flops on GTO Wizard AI at 50 big blind stack sizes. Here you can see the results, measured in terms of our overall betting volume which, if you're not familiar, is simply our sizing multiplied by our frequency. It's a good measurement of how aggressively we play a spot overall. I compared our approach against a GTO opponent with a GTO opening range to what we would do against Joe without any two range. You can see that the first five boards on our list of 10, all the ones which have any Broadway card on them, have virtually no betting from us at all, with the slight exception of the Queen-9-6 rainbow. However, the boards which are 9 high or lower have us putting in a lot more volume, especially the paired boards, the 996 rainbow and 733 rainbow. 
Why is this happening? Well, you might be able to guess. It's because these are the few boards on which Joe actually can't have very many strong hands at all. If he's not defending any offsuit 9x hands preflop, or very many suited 3x hands at all, then it makes sense that he would very rarely have strong hands on those boards. With the exception of pocket pairs that flop full houses, his range is going to include very few hands with trips or better, while ours includes the entire deck, which obviously means we can have every possible combo of trips plus. The low card straight boards have the same effect. He's not flopping a lot of straights or two pairs on these boards, but we have all of the straights and two pairs, even the offsuit ones, and both players can have all the sets. This means our usual approach of attacking higher boards against the big blind and playing cautiously on lower boards is completely reversed. We're essentially range checking the higher boards against Joe and attacking the lower ones where we know it's very difficult for him to have better than one pair. These concepts can be tricky to internalize. So let's take a look at a few node locked examples that I've prepared. First, two examples of our CBET strategy from in position versus Joe, and then one where we've defended the big blind and we're trying to fight back against Joe's very tight and strong CBETing range. First, we're going to look at this Ace King 7 rainbow board in the button versus big blind formation at 50 big blinds. As you can see here with the original sim using GTO ranges, this is a board where in position as the button is going to be able to basically range bet for a small size. If we were using a large sizing here, we would obviously have checks and these Ace King X boards can be fine for large sizes as well. But in a fairly simple way, a GTO strategy here where we just range bet is going to be quite effective. Now, you'll notice that there's no donk betting from the big blind. This is a very favorable ward for in position, even on the button. As you can see, in position has a huge nut advantage here and big blind really doesn't have any to do any donk betting. Now, if I switch to using a version of the sim where we are employing the ranges that I gave Joe and ourselves, our any two cards button opening range and Joe's big blind defending range, you can see it actually completely flips this spot around and it becomes a range donk bet for Joe. And it's not relevant to look at what happens once Joe checks because that check is never happening. A check is a 0% frequency. The fact that our strategy looks really weird and randomized here is not really we have to actually pay attention to. But of course, it's probably relatively likely that Joe does not have this 25% donk bet in his range. If we remove this option, then it should give us a better sense of what our actual strategy should look like. And what you'll, what you'll find is that if Joe does check his entire range, it now becomes a spot where we don't bet anything. We purely check. We really are never betting anything here, simply because look at the massive nut disadvantage that we're at here. There's very, very few hands in our range that can actually tolerate betting. Joe's equity is much higher than ours. If you look at the equity graph across all parts of the range, and most of our range here is just hoping to realize equity. It's really not a good spot for us. Joe has 65% equity. We're just really struggling with this incredibly wide range here. Part of the why we're not actually betting here is because if we did, we'd be very vulnerable against the check raise. If we actually node lock ourselves to range bet in this case, and we just hit node lock, we hit lock all and continue, then we'll get to see how often Joe would be able to check raise us if we continued range betting in this spot. And it might honestly be a range check raise. It might be that if we range bet here, we get punished hard that theoretically he can just check raise every single hand. Yeah, he can. He, his, every single hand in his range has enough equity to check raise here, right? Clearly, he's not actually doing this, but it is entirely viable that we would consider simply that it would be very, very difficult for us to get our C bet through often enough that we can get away with just range betting here. The question becomes, how extreme does Joe's strategy have to become before we can start range betting again? And if we do think that perhaps 20% is the margin by which he might overfold the flop, then is it feasible that we could still be able to bet a lot or maybe just bet hands? Let's keep this 25% size. We're going to unlock our strategy again. We're going to go back to a baseline approach of checking everything. And we're then going to lock Joe's strategy. We're going to have him, first of all, not check raise anything because we've already said he doesn't check raise unless he has the nuts on the river. But we're going to get rid of any check raise option that he might have. And it's already warning me that this is not part of GTO, but that's fine. And then we're going to node lock this strategy that instead of folding almost never here, 
he's going to be folding like 50 to 60%. It's going to be a lot higher than what he should be, but we're going to lock that in there. What I like to do with node locking is just put everything on fold to begin with and then manually paint in the stuff that we can be very confident that he's not going to fold. In this case, I don't think we can realistically expect him to fold a king here. Don't think we can expect him to fold a straight draw. Don't think we can expect him to fold a set. But beyond that, I don't know. He might uh, he might make big folds. He might fold a seven here. Not sure bottom pair is going to be good enough for Joe here. Let's go with that. We're going to lock that in as his response. And we're going to see if this very significant overfold is enough for us to start betting more here. In fact, it is. We go back to range betting. This is kind of the premise on which we employed that any two cards raising range preflop, that we ran that preflop and assuming that Joe was going to significantly overfold to a small C bet. And if that's the case, and even on a board where he's supposed to lead his entire range, and if we are range betting, he's supposed to check raise everything. If he doesn't, if he plays pure call or fold and he starts folding a seven to a small bet, we can now range bet everything. If he doesn't fold a seven, let's see if that affects anything here. Bearing in mind that he doesn't have a lot of hands containing a seven in his actual range. Nope, nothing changes. In the end, even if he's not folding a seven here, we actually still can quite easily range bet. And if we look at the hands that benefit the most from this by using the EV tool, you can see that the hands that are benefiting the most in terms of EV between betting and checking are going to be all of the weaker hands in our range, the very, very bottom of our range, the stuff that can't really realize equity very well by checking, like queen five off here. If we bet this, we're now making 20% of the pot compared to if we check, we're making 15%. About a third of our EV on top of what we're making by checking, we're actually gaining by betting queen five off here. Essentially, Joe's tightness is going to turn a lot of boards that should not be range bets against a very tight range into range bets, even when our range is extremely wide, simply because we realize much equity. Now, the caveat here is what we have to do on the turn. If we do range bet here, if we go with the range bet strategy, and then Joe calls, we are going to see that our turn strategy is going to have to revolve around slowing down a lot. It, let's say the turn is a brick, the deuce of clubs, one of the biggest bricks we can imagine here. Obviously not a card that affects Joe's range very much. His range is strong that once again, he's now supposed to donk bet again from out of position. But let's say he doesn't do that. Now, once, once more, we're up against an extremely strong range. We're no longer able to overbet this turn because we just don't have enough nut hands. And we still are very disincentivized from betting. We have few bets here. Only the top basically sets and two pair. But even the two pair, we're still kind of worried about the fact that he can have a set of kings or a set of sevens here, right? There really aren't very many hands that want to bet here. We're bluffing with a lot of 9x. I would imagine that has to do with interacting with some of his most likely folds. But you can see here that the optimal range that he's supposed to fold here based on the range that he gets here with it's going to look a bit different to reality. He's supposed to continue with a king and then fold an ace. That's probably unrealistic. Let's node lock him again. Let's now have him only continue with top pair plus. He's never going to fold an ace, but he's never going to continue with anything worse. Top pair plus on the turn against this two-thirds pot bet. And now we're actually betting at a very high rate, right? We're almost range betting the turn. And this is, again, what happens when egregiously overfolding. If we follow this through to the river, another brick, maybe a five, let's say. Once again, we're up against this very, very tight range. But even though he gets here with nothing that is worse than top pair, he's probably still going to have to make relatively big call downs in order to stop us from profitably bluffing. Even if we simplify to a two-thirds pot or a check on this river and have no all-ins, we know that Joe doesn't raise without the nuts. Considering he can't have 3-4 here, he can never raise, which is great. And if we delete his raising option from the tree, we see that immediately we're starting to be able to bet most of our 2-pair plus. And then let's say he only calls the river with 2-pair or better. Now we're actually still ending up in a spot where we're able to go for a triple barrel with basically everything. And we're printing here because of how much he's overfolding. If he's not willing to call down with top pair really at all, 
we're still going to be able to just blast off pretty happily against Joe's range in this spot. However, note that our two pairs and our ace jacks and ace queens, that might normally become hands that would go for value here, are slowing down. However, a hand like ace 10 is actually bluffing here, believe it or not. Because he's folding ace jack and ace queen, ace 10 is now turning itself into a bluff. It doesn't have enough showdown value to justify just checking. It can actually profitably bluff. And the same goes for the rest of those ace x hands. This is a really interesting run out. Obviously, it's a pretty blank one, which gives Joe a lot of one pair hands. But it's showing us that even when we think that Joe's range is really, really tight for continuing across each street, we are still going to reach the river in spots where Joe can actually find overfolds. We can still barrel off in instances. Now, the second board that we're going to look at is this 733 rainbow that I mentioned earlier on. Now, in the GTO version, you can see that this is a board where in position is going to once again use a small size because it's a paired board, it's a rainbow. However, it's not quite a range betting board because the big blind does possess a lot of 3x. If we look at how often the big blind has trips here, it's about 6.2%. It's not a frequency that's going to be particularly for the in position player, but they are going to have to take it into account, especially since in position has trips only 2.7% of the time. It's certainly it's going to influence the strategies here. However, if we flip this around and we look at the ranges that Joe is going to have, we'll see it's going to look very different. This is the scenario with the two ranges that apply when we're playing against Joe. We're opening any two. Joe's defending with 27%. You can see that Joe still has more best hands than we do. However, if we focus on the trips region specifically, Joe only has trips 1.8% of the time, but we have it 7.5%. Even though our range is any two cards, the actual frequency we have trips has gone up. And even though Joe has a lot of overpairs, we can actually put those overpairs in tough spots across multiple streets here. In this version of the spot, instead of actually being a board where we're using a small size, once Joe checks, again, we're assuming no donk betting from Joe here. This is now actually going to become a big bet board. A slightly unexpected development, perhaps, but it's a little bit more in keeping with how paired boards play when we're the outer position preflop raiser and our opponent can't really flop very many trips. You do see big bets on those boards, and this is no different. This is a spot where a lot of our trips wants to bet big, and a lot of our other hands can bet big in order to apply a lot of pressure to those overpairs across multiple streets. If we now look at progressing through what Joe's response to this bet might be, well, we know he's not going to check raise because we know he has no check raises. Let's immediately get rid of that. And that might influence our, our frequency even more. We're at 55% now. And now we can see that there's quite a lot of hands here that Joe is supposed to continue against any two cards or against our wide range. But once again, he's probably not. Let's see how far this takes us when it comes to our range. Let's say Joe is continuing with basically any one pair or better here. And maybe we'll be generous and say he's continuing with any straight draw and any ace high with two over cards. And he's now overfolding only by about 9%, but that's enough to allow us to bet 91% of the time here. We're almost able to range bet with a big size here, simply because Joe is not check raising at all, and it becomes very favorable for us to just realize equity on remaining streets. Now, we could possibly make an argument for splitting our sizes here and potentially going smaller with of our bluffs and just going bigger for value against Joe, but realistically, maybe that's complicating things a little bit too much. It might be quite simple to just go ahead with a strategy like this, check back a lot of our strongest ace highs, check back a couple of hands for deception, and maybe a little bit of protection of our range on the turn, but we don't really have to worry that much about here, about that here because uh, Joe is not going to show a ton of turn aggression. Ultimately, this might actually be a very viable strategy here on the flop. Now, we've kind of seen how the dynamics develop here across the later streets. I don't think we need to go into turn and river again for this scenario, but it does illustrate here the EV that we gain from Joe never check raising the flop and how that's going to filter into our strategy, allowing us to bet the flop a lot more aggressively, especially when it's a board like this where we can have those big hands that he can't and we're now able to use a big size on a board where a small size might otherwise make a lot more sense. Our last node lock spot here is going to be one where we're defending the big blind against Joe. And it's going to be this king-queen-eight 
rainbow board. Now, in the GTO version of this spot, we're obviously defending quite wide, even though Joe is opening under the gun in this case, and it's at 50 big blinds. We're still defending a lot of suited hands. We're folding a lot more offsuit stuff. And that creates a circumstance where this board is very good for the opening range. And of course, that's going to mean that opening range gets to bet quite a lot. Where they're betting big here about 80% of the time. Pretty high aggression board, high betting volume from in position here. If we look at the version of this spot where Joe is the opener, obviously his range is going to be even tighter. That's going to be we have to keep in mind. But in addition to that, maybe Joe isn't going to bet quite as big. We'll see if that offsets it here. Now, I do want to look at our response here because it's going to be interesting to see just how much defending we're going to have to do even against this three quarters pot bet here we're folding quite a lot but we are raising 7.4 percent of the time we still have plenty of hands that want to raise we still have hands that can raise for value we've got the jack nines the 10 nines raising as a bluff at rate there's plenty of hands here that can raise and we have about 41 combos total of raises which of course makes a lot of sense we'll keep that in mind as we go and look at the version here where joe is opening super tight and we are defending quite a bit tighter as well this is going to be what that spot looks like as you can see i've tightened up our range quite a bit it's hard to know exactly whether this is the appropriate range here considering how tight joe's range is on the right i would imagine that if we did run this through a preflop it might allow us to fold even more preflop simply because the preflop solver would be assuming that joe plays perfectly across all the streets in practice maybe calling with a range like this is going to work pretty well we're folding the weakest offsuit broadways because they have a lot of uh, reverse implied odds on a lot of boards but we are still three betting kings plus ace king off etc for value and we're not really three bet bluffing much here if we do it's going to come mostly from our blocker region we're not going to worry about that for now this is our range and we're going to carry it forward to this flop now i've assigned joe just a half pot bet size here and you can see that because it's such a good board for him it wants him to just range bet that's pretty trivial that's not that we should be particularly surprised about. However, we don't necessarily think Joe is actually going to do this. We will tweak this in a second. But to look at our response, you can see that it does want us to still have check raises. In fact, the check raise frequency goes slightly up. And we're still folding a lot, but we're raising now 8.8%. And again, that's because the bet size is now only 50%. If we look at what Joe is supposed to do versus the check raise... He's going to continue at a high rate, but he's betting hands like jacks and then folding. He's betting ace-queen and then mixing. We can expect him to have hands that fold. However, again, in practice, Joe is a huge nit. Let's node lock his range here to where he only bets for value. We've already said he doesn't bluff. Let's put everything on check like I did before. And we will say top pair or better is his value range. And that's it. He has no bluffs. He's not betting his ace jacks, his jack tens, anything like that. We're just locking everything right there. And based on this, we are now going to see a pretty big change in our strategy. Take a look at this. We're now folding a massive frequency. And it does still have us raising a little bit with maybe blockers, hands that do have implied odds on later streets like our jack tens. But that's on the assumption that this is Joe's response. And he actually folds ace king and re-raises well what if he doesn't do that i don't think he's ever going to re-raise here but i don't think he's ever going to fold let's put call at 100 percent. and when that happens we're now going to see we're actually playing check raise or fold which is very interesting and we're really only check raising with value and then hands that have a little bit of that implied odds possibility on later streets the jack 10 is in there presumably because we do get paid a lot when we make a straight and then a little bit of the 10-9 and the jack-9 for the same. A little bit of the ace-10 and the ace-jack for the same. Tiny bit of the queen-jack. I would assume that's just partially because of blocking power and those backdoor flush and straight outs that we have. But other than that, it is pure value. Eights, queens, queen-eight, king-eight, king-queen. That is it. We are never calling here. We have no to call because Joe's range is tight. That we're not going to realize equity through calling. His range is only strong hands, which means he's almost always going to be able to bet turns. We're just not going to realize equity and we should just fold a ton on the flop here. We're not even calling top pair because he's not betting enough of those jack tens, ace jacks, etc. If we did add the straight draws to his range here, let's see what effect that has. It might have an effect, but it might not be that significant. If he bets all of his open enders and his gut shots here, 
Now, this is a little bit more of an aggressive version of Joe here, maybe a little bit more ambitious. If he does bet those hands, and then we still maybe would say he doesn't fold to the raise. We go up a little bit with our frequencies here. We're now, uh, it's kind of unusual that we're raising stuff like 8.5 as a bluff, but this would most likely be, yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we still have him pretty much never folding. Uh, let's just actually put it at call 100 here. If he calls every single time, there's now going to be a small amount of value that we can get from those Jack 10s. There's going to probably be, yeah, there's a tiny bit of like, there's King 10. The Queen 6 is in there. It's a little surprising. Queen 6 with a backdoor, 8, 7, 8, 5. Might be implied odds when we turn two pair, plus we have that set blocker. But generally speaking, still just never calling. It's all just going to be a question of how much opportunity do we have to raise for thinner value or for implied odds purposes. And ultimately, it's a very, very tight strategy one way or the other. A very interesting response, but quite obvious when you think about how tight Joe's range actually is as a whole. That is going to do it for this video. Thank you everybody for following with me. As you can see, Joe is making a lot of mistakes and there's a lot of money to be made playing against him if we understand how to do it. If you guys have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me via Discord and ask questions there or leave a comment on this video and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. In the meantime, thank you for watching, everybody. I'll be back again with more videos. Good luck, everyone.